All right, welcome to the last grasp on robotics uh, talk for this semester. Uh, my name is Mark Yim. I'm the uh, faculty host for today's talk. Uh, as a quick reminder, previously recorded talks can be found on our YouTube channel and website. If you're joining via Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll answer these questions during the uh, panel session at the end of the talk. If you're here in person, we'll give you an opportunity to um, provide your questions as we go. So uh, today was supposed to be Bill Smart from Oregon State University, but uh, we found out last night he got sick, he got ill, and he was not able to travel. So uh, we were very fortunate to have our local rising star, Mark Miskin, uh, who agreed to give a last minute talk. So Mark is an assistant professor in electrical systems engineering at UPenn. He did his BS at RPI, his PhD in physics at the University of Chicago and a postdoc at Cornell. Uh, his work has won awards from AFOSR, ARO, Sloan and Packard Fellowships. He's won a bunch of awards. He's been featured on lots of media outlets, including New York Times, um, the MIT TR35, CNN, BBC, NPR. He also uh, gave a really exciting TED talk um, I think it one of, some of his uh, work has been one of the most exciting forward-looking uh, work in microbiotics uh, in the world. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> welcome, uh, Mark Miskin. Awesome. This will be fun since there's not a lot of people. This will be more more informal. Um, so uh, I've titled my talk "Tiny Robots," um, and as Mark already said, uh, my group's a microrobotics group. Um, and so it's tiny robots for for two reasons, right? Uh, one is aspirational. We we continue to always want to make our robots smaller. Um, so there's no one particular one. But I also mean a specific level of tiny. So tiny can mean any number of things, right? Small, whatever. It could be a millimeter, it could be whatever. By this, I, I really mean microscopic. So every robot we're going to talk about today, everything I'm going to show you, one of the commitments in, in our group is that they all have to be too small for you to see. Um, and if you want something to think about as a size comparison for almost all the robots that you're going to look at, uh, you could do a lot worse than, than this guy right here. So uh, this is a water bear. Um, it's everyone's favorite microorganism, right? Uh, they're cute, they're fun, they can survive in space and walk around on six legs. Um, and water bears come in a range of sizes. The, they never get bigger than a millimeter. Um, none are ever larger than that, so you can never see them by eye. Um, and the smallest get down to about 50 microns or so, so about half a hair's width in size. Uh, and the vast majority of robots that you're going to see in this talk today fit within that size range, right? They're all basically bookended by being under a millimeter and being over tens of microns, right in that sweet spot of biological microorganisms. Um, now, I've got the water bears up here for another reason, uh, which is that, uh, you know, to me, like, I begin a lot of my talks with microorganisms because they're this reminder of, of how much cool stuff you can make, uh, even though it's really small, right? Just because something's tiny doesn't mean that it's going to be simple. And, and biology is the greatest reminder of that at all, of all, right? That all of the fundamental processes in our bodies take place at these small length scales from these really, really remarkably tiny things called cells that perform computation, that sense, that carry out actions in unbelievably sophisticated ways. Um, and the water bear is another great example of this, right? This multicellular organism, which is capable of doing all kinds of really cool stuff, right? It can hunt, it can sense, it can think, it can locomote. And it does all of these at very high degrees of complexity, in spite of the fact that it's very small. Um, so nature here, to me, is, is issuing you a challenge, right? You, there's no rule that says you can't build something that's small and very complex. The question for humans is, is how? How do we go and do that? Now, there is one thing that we build uh, routinely that is very small and very complex, and that's microelectronics. Um, and we've gotten very good at that in, in the last 50 years or so. And so uh, one question you could ask yourself is, okay, for 50 years, we've been making microchips smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in size. Um, how much stuff could you pack in the space of a water bear? What's the most complicated piece of electronics you could fit? Uh, so, so let's see, anyone have a guess how many transistors could you fit in a water bear? There's actually a small enough number of people we could legitimately ask the audience, uh, barring, barring my students. Michelle, what do you think? Yeah, order of magnitude. Fifty. Okay, we got we got order a hundred from Michelle. Mark, what do you what do you what would you guess? Well, Mark's <laughs> pretty pretty big range. So uh, we have fifty and we have a million. Any any other guesses? Ten thousand. You're gonna split the difference. Smart man. So uh, so the answer is of course a trick question. Right? It depends which 
how you're building those little transistor transistors. But let's say for the sake of argument, you're going to do it state of the art, the absolute best that you could possibly do. Um, well, the state of the art looks something like this. Uh, so this is a five nanometer, what we would call a uh, transistor process. And this was from, from Global Foundries and IBM um, in 2017. And the way you should think about it is that uh, the gap between each of these two little parts of a transistor, and this, and this image is about five nanometers. So it's about two DNA strands would fit in between those two little parts. Um, and on this one chip, these people packed something like 1 billion transistors per square millimeter, which means that in the space of a water bear, let's call it about 100 microns on a side, that's between 1 and 10 million transistors. It is a lot, a lot. Um, if you compared that with, say, a PlayStation 1, a PlayStation 1, the whole thing was about a million transistors. So in the space of a water bear, you could fit pretty much almost any piece of commercial electronics from the mid 90s. If, if you, you know, it doesn't mean it would work, there'd be a lot of engineering to actually doing that. But the point is, is you can fit an incredible amount of stuff in here. And we take this for granted, right? Your, your new iPhone has little switches in it that literally are the size of DNA strands. It is mind blowing how small we push transistors. Um, another fun comparison would be if you put up say a cell wall, a little boundary between cells and the outside world, uh, to scale, it would be about that big, right? That's how small how small these devices actually are. Um, you know, totally remarkable how successful we've been in this sense. Um, it also should give you a clue. We're, we're not making things too much smaller in the future. We're, we're very much running out of out of floor plan. Um, but it does sort of open the door, and it suggests that you know, even though ostensibly a microorganism is really tiny, uh, there's really a lot you could do. You could really fit quite quite some complex electronics in that space. I mean, indeed, people have done this, right? It's not just theoretical. There's now examples in the field of building legitimate computing platforms in these very tiny sizes. Um, so here's another example. And, and this computer actually came out about the same time as, as those transistors got pushed down to smaller length scales. And so it actually is using a, a, an older process development. Um, but this is in 2017. This is currently, I think, is still the record holder for the tiniest computer in the world. Um, and this white thing next to it, that's a grain of rice. So uh, a grain of rice, you may know, is a couple millimeters in size by about a millimeter, which means that this thing is under one millimeter. It's about 300 microns on the side, about the size of a water bear. Um, and packed inside of this little, little tiny chip is a lot of stuff. So there are sensors on this. This one, I think, senses temperature. It's got a little microprocessor. So it has a processor similar to what you'd find in a smartwatch. It actually has like a Cortex-M zeros inside of that. It has a little bit of RAM. It has four kilobits of RAM in there, clock. It has power. Um, it has a communication module in the form of a little LED that can blink data up to you and a little photo detector that can get data back down. And all of this is packed into this immensely small size. And by the way, in an, in an old process note, and, and this was made in sort of like early, like mid 2000s ish electronics processing. Um, so not only is it theoretical that you could pack a lot of things into the space, it's actually been done. And from a robotics perspective, this is pretty amazing, right? This is everything you want for a robot. You got clocks, you got sensors, you got a memory, you got a processor, all of that stuff. And it's done. It's there waiting for you. So in other words, uh, after 50 years of microelectronics uh, innovation, after 50 years of Moore's law, we finally hit the bottom. And the result is basically this, it's the head of a robot. It's all the smarts, all the processing, all the sensing jammed into a pre-made package in the form of semiconductor microelectronics. But that, you know, if you're building robots, your story doesn't stop there. Uh, it's not enough to just have a head, you gotta have a body too. And so you can ask, well, what kind of innovation has there been in that space? Um, and again, remarkably, the answer has been a lot. Um, that people have been building all forms of, of different micro robots now since you know the 90s and the late 2000s. I mean, they come in all kinds of different ways of creating propulsion, um, different forms of motors that you can use for moving around at small sizes. Um, some use ultrasound to propel themselves. Some use chemical reactions to make little bubbles that push things. Um, some called biohybrids. You basically take something that moves like a sperm cell and you fit it with a little magnet harness and then you can pilot that thing around. There's loads of different systems for generating propulsion at these different size scales. It used to be a statement was it's really hard to locomote it at tiny sizes. Um, I would argue that's just not true anymore. We actually have a variety of different platforms that, that facilitate locomotion at these small sizes. Um, so it's also very encouraging. The challenge is if you want to do both, right? If you wanted to really build something that looks like a big robot that has the smarts and the, and the, and the actuation integrated into a single package that's fully autonomous that you could write instructions to that runs around and does something, that's the hard part, because while electronics gives you one half, the smarts, and all these other platforms give you the other half, the, the brains, um, it should be apparent from the previous slide that something that swims around because it's being shot with ultrasound isn't necessarily going to play nice with an onboard computer on that little tiny device. Um, and largely, this is what my group tries to address, is this challenge, is 
how do we build systems for, for movement, for motion, for whatever, that are gonna play nice with semiconductor microelectronics so that we could legitimately build a micro robot that, that has onboard, onboard compute, onboard intelligence that you can send off that looks just like a big robot, except smaller, that looks like that water bear, right? The water bear doesn't need anyone telling it what to do. It, it does all of its own thinking and then does what it wants. So um, basically what I'm gonna tell you about today are a handful of different platforms that we've developed for addressing this gap. And then some of the applications that we're looking at and, and sort of using these, these first generations of devices. Um, and the first one we built was this, um, and this is kind of a workhorse in our lab. And this was something I, I developed largely in my postdoc. Um, and it's a new actuator that we came up with for, for facilitating spanning this, this, this barrier, right? A new way of moving. Um, and it's this device that we call surface electrochemical actuator or a SEAS. Um, and this is a bending actuator. So what you're seeing is this big black thing on the side of the slide, that's a metal probe that we can apply voltages. And then the actuator is this little thing that's curling up and basically you think of it like curling up like a helix. And it's doing that in response to voltages that we're applying from this, this big metal electrode. And then the other half of the circuit that's closed, this thing lives in water. And so you're closing the second circuit path through the solution. Um, now, this little guy might not look like much, but uh, if you put a red blood cell up on the screen, it would be about that big. And so this is a remarkably tiny actuator, bending and unbending between these, these very tiny states. Um, now, uh, it turns out that these actuators have a number of other really special properties that make them very unique for, for micro-robotics applications. Uh, one is, is that they're unbelievably thin. Um, and so this, this component, I would argue, is an honest-to-God nanotechnology. That little thing you were looking at bending on the previous slide basically made out of a layer of titanium and a layer of platinum. And again, this scale bar is 10 nanometers. So you could again, think of this, this is one cell wall's worth of stuff. Um, and, uh, or in other words, a dozen atoms or so from end to end. And our whole actuator fits within that entire budget. And then this stuff underneath this aluminum oxide and that silicon, that's just stuff we built it on. You don't have to worry too much about that. Now, why is that important? Well, if you want to bend to a very tiny radius, you have to do that without breaking. And one way to do that very simply is to make yourself flexible by being thin. If you think of like a big piece of metal, right, by making the metal thinner, it makes it more flexible. And it turns out that if you want to get down to say like a, a, a cell-sized robot or a 10 micron actuator, you actually have to be a dozen atoms or so thin or else you'll fracture. Um, how does this thing actually work? Well, uh, another neat piece of physics is that if you take a piece of platinum and you put it in water and you apply a voltage to it, uh, it turns out that uh, atoms from the water will attach or remove themselves from the surface of the platinum depending on what voltage you use. Now, this creates a change in energy because you're changing the number of bonds on that surface, and then you can use that for actuation. You've changed the density of bonds, so you've changed the force, and then that creates something that moves. Now, normally a piece of metal doesn't care about this because it's billions and billions of atoms thick, but when you're just a dozen atoms or so thick, you genuinely care, right? That's a big deal. You've added one more layer of atoms. Um, and that allows you to create a very large force um, that, that can generate those large deformations that you see in that movie. The last bit that makes these very special for microrobotics is how much voltage you have to apply to go from all the way, no atoms adsorbed to all the way, all atoms adsorbed. Um, and if you characterize that, you find out that your actuator basically goes from totally flat to totally curved over a span of about 200 MV. So you should think about this side, nothing adsorbed, this side, all sites filled, and that's why it saturates. And then in between the two, from rail to rail, that's about two, 200 millivolts. Um, now, that's a very special voltage scale. It's basically set by the amount of energy relative to, to room temperature, to KBT, to Boltzmann's constant. Um, and it turns out that that same voltage scale is exactly what sets the voltage to turn on or off a transistor in semiconductor microelectronics. So this is the last key bit, is now you've got all the parts you need, right? I have a system that's going to play nice with electronics because it uses the same relative voltage. Um, it's super thin, which makes it flexible and able to go down to these small sizes. And it's capable of performing large deformations, which makes it useful in robotics. Um, it turns out by sort of uh, uh, some other weird features of these physics, uh, you actually have relatively high force for this mechanism. And there's reasons for that, but it's not really super relevant for this talk. So you get about one nanonewton of force, which may not sound like a lot, uh, but for a lot of our robots, that means that they can carry somewhere between, you know, one and 10 times their body weight. Um, so each of these little robots, you can think about like ants because they have these giant powerful actuators in their arms. Um, and the power to run this thing costs about 10 nanowatts, uh, which you should think of as a very, very tiny number. Um, and virtually all of our robots were dominated by compute and how they operate. Um, and typically actuation is, is under like 10% or so of the power budget, which is another kind of neat feature to being small, right? Normally it's the other way around, but, but we're, we're small and efficient. 
The last cool feature of these actuators is you can build them massively in parallel. So we worked really hard to make sure that everything we do to make these is done with standard semiconductor processing. And so just like circuits, you can now make millions and millions of these little actuators that you can wire together and have them operate as, as a group. Um, so now we were happy. We said, okay, let's build some dumb little robot to show this idea works. You know, it's one thing to say you can get actuators to play nice with electronics. It's another to actually do it. Um, and so we built a very simple robot where we just took two little solar cells and then wired them up to two sets of legs. And then to go from bending to kind of something more controlled, we put these sort of rigid blocks of polymer on top to localize bending into hinges and then make arms and legs for our little tiny robots. Um, now, since electronics you can make in parallel in a clean room, and now you can make the actuators in parallel, uh, that means you can now build robots in parallel. Um, so we built these things on four inch wafers. My group always works on, on the largest format we can. Um, you build something like 10 to the six robots on a wafer, you build 10 to the four or something on a little chip about the size of your hand. And then we also developed protocols for getting them off of that chip and deploying them out into the world. Um, so we came up with ways of, of basically etching out the surface these little robots are built on, um, dissolving it away and leaving behind now a swarm with something like 10 to the four robots trapped inside of it. Okay. And you can do fun things with these swarms and I'll, I'll come back to this later in the talk, like suck them up in the pets and inject them back out. Um, once they're released like that, you can basically think of them like microorganisms and you can handle them in sort of the same way. Um, so here's a fun little movie we made where we took these little robots, we injected them in some pond water. Uh, and in just a second, you'll see there is a paramecium you, hanging out in your solution. Okay, but do they work? Right, and uh, of course the answer is yes, but let me show you that briefly. Um, so to make this robot walk, we did something kind of hacky and I'll, we'll, we'll work our way back from that as we go. Uh, we basically took these little solar cells and then we made a device that allows us to focus a laser spot wherever we want in this microscope field of view. Um, you can see this lasers right here on the top part of the slide. And then what we can do is by cycling that laser back and forth between those little solar cells, we can trigger different sets of actuators and cause this little robot to march around. And so indeed now you have your little device marching around the micro world. Now, what does this demonstrate? I mean, on the one hand, it's super fun to get up every day and, and zap robots with lasers. Um, Kyle, one of my graduate students is probably doing that right now, presumably having a great time. Uh, but I'll remind you that the core part of this is you've now shown that you can integrate electronics with, with actuators, right? You can actually make these th two things work together. And from the actuator's point of view, it couldn't care less whether or not you're doing this with a solar cell or with a computer or something else sitting above it. It's electronic. All you have to do is supply sufficient voltage and current and the device is going to move. Um, and so sort of the next generation that came about, this was work done largely by my former postdoc, Michael Reynolds, when he was still at Cornell, um, was to then get rid of the laser, right? And so the next thing we did was build very simple pieces of electronics, basically in the form of clocks uh, that we could tap into different uh, phase shifts relative to the primary clock and create a gate pattern. Um, so Michael basically made a master clock and then you can choose where in phase you wanna to tie to from that, that global sinusoid. Um, and then by latching legs to different phase offsets, you can generate whatever gate pattern you like. And so Michael made ones that are little quadrupeds um, that walk, you know, this one's got a bad leg, so we'll, we'll deal with him later. Um, we made little bipeds uh, that walk by having a whatever 45 degree phase shift between the front and the back leg to generate a locomotion cycle. Um, and my favorite, we made it. Uh, so this robot does alternating tripod, uh, but it is, as you see, 100 microns on the side, so smaller than a hair's width, um, shuffling around all on its own. Um, I'll point out this robot is fully autonomous. There's no one telling it what to do at all. Um, and the power that it requires to run on, it's again powered by little solar cells on board it. Um, it's basically in daylight. So it runs on about one sun, um, which means that, you know, you could take it outside in the Petri dish and that power is sufficient in order for it to click on and start walking from one place to another, which is kind of cool. Um, one thing I'll say briefly for folks who have seen a lot of this is uh, all of these robots are still underwater. Um, which is kind of a limitation in some respects, right? You'd really like robots to be able to go into any environment in the micro scale. And so one of the other things we've been actively working on in, in our group has been developing ways of basically packaging the uh, solution chemistry that you use for bending into a single actuator to build something that can walk in air. Um, we have some early success in this. So these are sort of polymer-based uh, slash ionic liquid actuators that use similar principles of, of doing electrochemistry, but now all within a solid state mechanism within a polymer layer. Um, and these, this device is now bending and waving at you, but this is fully in air. It's been completely released. Um, and we haven't gotten this to work yet, but I think we're very close. Uh, so here's sort of an array of these, which are, we figured out how to release their arms and legs, but not quite get them out into the world. But, but coming soon, we'll hopefully be land bot. We'll be micro robots that can now 
uh, leave the water, much like life, right? Your life begins in salty water and then crawls out of the sea. Uh, our micro robots will do the same. Um, in parallel with that, though, you might say, okay, that's cool, but what's with the legs? Like, why, why so many legs? There's other ways of making propulsion. Does everything have to be legged? Um, and, you know, if you've worked with any legged robots, you know, legs are hard, right? <laughs> They're kind of difficult compared to other, other things you might consider. Um, and so one of the things that my group got interested in, in particular, uh, these two students, uh, one of which is here, uh, Will and Lucas, was figuring out other ways of trying to do propulsion that, that don't feature arms and legs. Um, and if you're paying attention to the first part, you may have noticed that a lot of the features that really were useful for microrobotics stem from the fact that we were using electrochemistry to absorb these ions. And so you might say, okay, if all I really care about is matching this voltage scale and, and making it compatible with CMOS with microelectronics, then I might as well just use some other form of electrochemistry to generate propulsion, um, but hopefully one that's solid state, that doesn't feature moving parts, that instead just can generate propulsion more, more easily. Um, and so here's what they came up with. Um, it's a very, very simple idea. Uh, basically, you take a bunch of solar cells, something that generates voltage and current, and you wire them to two electrodes. And that's all you do, right? You just build that one simple structure. Now, what happens if you do that? Um, well, if you take anything in water and you put an electric field on it, uh, you can get it to move, right? If you think of like electrophoresis, it's the canonical example, but basically you can create fluid flows around that object due to the fact that there are inherently charges on most things when they're submerged in water. And if you put a field on charges, you can generate forces. Um, now, one way to do that is normally you apply that field externally, but if instead I have these little solar cells and these two electrodes, I could also drive chemistry in the surrounding, surrounding environment, just think of it like a battery, and that in turn should generate flow. And indeed it does. If you just take this little tiny device and you shine light on it to drive these solar cells, you get linear propulsion for this device moving along. Now what's cool about this is you can show convincingly that this has to do with the electric field by basically doing experiments where you vary the, the current that you're supplying or vary the conductivity of the solution and you find goes up with more current, it goes down with conductivity. And if you plot them both as electric field, they live on top of each other. So in fact, yes, the speed is proportional to the electric field you're generating from the robot. Um, but what's cooler is you can also show that it doesn't really matter what the chemistry you're using to propel it is uh, because it only cares about the field. So we ran these robots in a variety of different chemical environments. Uh, the, the main message is that data can pretty much lives on top of each other up to a factor of three or something like that. Um, and in every case you get this linear propulsion mechanism. Um, so you can completely ignore the chemical environment around you to first order. And just, if you wanna go faster, throw more current, right? That's all you have to do. And on top of that, they'll be proportional. Um, we got into this mechanism a lot and we tried to study how it really works. Um, and so um, we also started doing side imaging these robots um, and looking at what they do while they're under illumination. And one of the neat things we discovered is that as it's moving, it's actually sort of skating on a little layer of fluid underneath. You can just see when the robot comes into the field of view of this movement. Um, you think it's sort of like an air hockey table in some sense, right? That little layer of fluid provides uh, uh, support to balance the piece of gravity. Um, and we worked out a model to try to you know, predict sort of the angle of attack of this robot and gap has to function in field parameters. Um, one of the consequences of that model, though, is you find out it's seen basically linear to current. And that lets you do some cool things you're going to do with the robot. So, let's um, say I have this little robot where I have two separate engines that are glued together, and I want to bring it from here to this waypoint over there. Uh, well, our model predicts that the velocity of either engine points in the forward direction and is proportional to the current you supply. Um, and so, in some sense, the robot behaves an awful lot like a, a differential wheel. It does almost the exact same thing. Um, and so, and that means that, you know, okay, the radius, the change of angle on this for our client is going to be quite different in the current. And then you steal all your favorite control loss for wheel robots. Right? And there's nothing wrong, right? You can just directly apply your favorite controllers. So I think Will can correct me if I'm wrong. Is this your bank or anyone? So uh, you steal your favorite controller and you apply it directly and it works to snap down on the full scale. Um, that lets you do other fun stuff like do a little robust line deprivation if you want to uh, work around. Space. Or you can make micro robot combo. <laughs> so here each robot's been assigned a waypoint that is the next one ahead of it in the chain. Uh, they'll just chase each other around this field of view, and then Will is telling the front of the robot where to go to talk to us. Um, one of the neat things about this technique, by the way, which I think is pretty cool, is that um, because you're controlling each of these optically, uh, all this is closed loop, but computers basically watching where these robots are and updating how to zap the lasers to tell us what to do. Um, one of the neat things about light is light is very easy to multiplex. And we're literally watching a multiplex image being projected onto the screen behind you. 
Um, and in this really opens the door, I think, to doing lots of micro robots under independent control. That, that typically a lot of other schemes of micro robotics, when you're with, say, magnetic fields, are very hard to multiplex. It's hard to pattern magnetic fields in space. Um, this one's extremely straightforward. And so, one of the things we're excited to start doing is scaling this up to having hundreds and maybe even thousands of micro robots all over the country control often. Uh, now, one of the things that came out of this work was this other idea of saying, okay, cool, so we have uh, these little micro robots, and uh, they're, they're doing uh, essentially doing chemistry. Um, and here's the big chemistry for propulsion, but what other types of chemistry can you get? I mean, at the end of the day, what it's really doing is doing solution of these dots, and then um, that influences you know, how it moves and speed and, and whatever the main thing is actually can go. But you can think about this more abstractly and argue that. I think all kinds of other chemistry. In fact, I can even couple the chemistry, say this robot does, the chemistry that one is doing, if I can sense things or, or look at what's going on around me. Um, and so we said, all right, uh, what, what could we do with the actuator instead of generating propulsion, instead of trying to deliver the produce reaction? And the chemical reaction itself is actually the subject of the this. Uh, and so the first thing we did was this, and this was work done by Lucas Hansen, um, as well as counterpart in terms of propulsion work. Oh, did I lose the microphone? That's what <laughs> Thanks. So that's why you have to come to the seminar. <laughs> so uh, first thing we did, we took one of these little robots that you just saw in the propulsion movie, we put it into nickel plating solution. Um, it, nickel plating, like all electric chemistry, again, has roughly the same characteristic voltage, same characteristic current. And so if you put one of these in the nickel plating solution and you shoot it with light, guess what happens? Uh, it grows nickel. And it grows nickel on one of its electrodes and produces a gas on the other. And if you put two of them close together, they can both grow nickel and then bond together and form a solid metallic bond between these two little robots. Um, now, I immediately thought this was awesome. Uh, from my point of view, you are literally turning light into metal. And, and what could be cooler than that, right? You shoot light at this thing and it turns light into metal. Um, and so we started building robots which were now specialized for this purpose. Um, so we built one that was symmetric, so that grows nickel radially outward from it, and then anything that's nearby, it can now bond to. And we got a little bit better at doing this, too. You'll notice the movie looks a lot better. We're growing more metal. Everything's nice. Um, when you take a bunch of these things and you put them together, we said, okay, that'd be kind of cool. Maybe they could bond together to, like, form a material. And we found out that something else happened, and they do that, right? That's certainly something that occurs. But we found out something else interesting happens, too, and that's that they form these little bubbles. And if you watch this movie, you see like, oh, the bubbles are kind of weird, right? They, they pick up little robots and they drop them. And that's kind of a way of shuffling things around within the system. So I wonder what would happen if we, we really pushed that, right? If we really made that go as hard as we could. Um, so we did a little more work and we designed these things to make bubbling now a feature of the device. Um, and now you shoot them with light and you're looking at the side angle. Uh, and they start electroplating and create this you know, bubbling mess or whatever. Um, and you can see robots start to kind of launch up. But they also come back down. And in just a few seconds, you're going to see that not only do they go up and they come down, they actually create a nice little convective flow, which drives them actually back to the central part of the plating. Um, so this was kind of neat. It was, it was sort of an unexpected discovery, like this little robot's going to get dragged back into where it's going to start back into the plating pile on the other side. And one of the cool features we found out is if you run this experiment long enough, they will actually all bond together. So you go from sort of this dust of little robots, you zap it with light, they all start moving. And then by virtue of that process and the convection that they generate, they inevitably come together to form a, a large collective object, um, which when you image it, looks something like this. Uh, so you go from your collection of robots into now an assembled structure that gets built on the other side. Um, and all of this happening uh, emergently from, from the robot itself, right, that you're shooting with light. Um, I think this is really cool uh, because to me, like this, this, you know, we talk about self-assembly and we talk about things that build themselves. Um, but, but usually, at least in the material science world, it's at very low energy. There are things that sort of self-assemble by random thermal jiggling. This is a very high energy. Um, and so as a consequence, it, it winds up inheriting some interesting properties. Um, so one thing we do know, for example, is if you compress one of these structures and load it mechanically, you get, you know, force response curves like you would for any other material. Um, and while this may not look like much, this poor little material is only getting up to about 0.1 MPA uh, on a strength to weight ratio. It's actually pretty good. Um, this, this material does almost as well as bulk nickel in spite of the fact that it was made by these little self-assembled particles. Um, there's one other neat thing, though, about this material, which is if you drive it all the way over here and you completely break it, you can put it back in the plating solution, zap it again with laser, and it reheals. Um, and we just got data, I think, I think yesterday, the curves trace right on top of each other. It's absolutely beautiful, um, which is kind of another neat fact. So um, I'm super excited about this work, and I, I think one of the, the neat things that we're doing here uh, is you now have a system uh, where 
you're building a material, the material is architected, the architected material can heal, and it does all of this by virtue of active agents inside of it. Um, and it's not a big step from here to start adding intelligence on those agents as well so that they can control how they played over time in response to things that they're sensing. Um, and I think that's gonna be a really fun direction for, for future work. Now, if you're in the audience, you may be wondering though, what happened to this, right? <laughs> So we've seen whatever, four robots or something like that, uh, but they're all really dumb, right? They're all just like these little puppets that the, you know, like the smartest robot we've seen so far is the one, the hexapod, and that's a wind up toy, right? It does one thing, it walks, that's it. Um, where's, the, where's the smarts? In the beginning of the talk, I promised you smarts. I said, we were gonna have little tiny computers. What, what the hell happened to that theme? Um, and so for the last, uh, whatever, 15, 20 minutes, I wanna come back to that and talk about, no, we didn't give up on it, of course. That's just where the talk ends, right? This is the last thing I'll show you is, is the first uh, the first ever microscopic robot with, with onboard computation, with a full microprocessor memory, all the good stuff that you want in a big robot. Um, so this is our third generation sort of micro robots. Uh, we've named this one SmartBot. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna name the next one, but um, whatever. Uh, and this was done collaboratively with folks at the University of Michigan, specifically David Blau, who, who is the, who's the circuit designer who built that computer on the previous slide. Um, and so David's group worked with us to develop essentially a, a chip for, for doing micro robotics. Um, and we managed to pack quite a lot inside of this, this tiny space. So um, the whole robot is about 210 microns by about 335. And I should say there's actually three versions that come in different sizes. So this is the medium version. There's also a larger one where it's more like 300 by 300 and a, and a skinny one that's like whatever, uh, 300 by 150 or something like that. Um, but in that geometry, uh, we've got a bunch of stuff. So we've got onboard solar cells again for power. So everywhere you see these little kind of square things, you should think of those as solar cells. Um, it's about whatever, two thirds of the robot's body. Um, it has two sets of thermometers, one on the left side, one on the right side. Um, and you can both detect the nominal temperature and you can detect differentials. So you can say, is my left half hotter than my right half? Stuff like that. There's voltmeters for detecting electric fields. Um, there's a special comms module that you can use to talk to this robot. So a special little solar cell down here and some accompanying electronics that allow you to write instructions to it and tell it what to do. Uh, some circuitry developed for actuators that sits underneath metallic pads. So basically what these do is they generate clock signals and then you can change the frequency and the phase offshifts, offshifts for those clock signals. So you have a very high level control over how the robot moves. Um, and then jammed in all the space in through here, uh, that is our computer, right? We fit a microprocessor and some memory, right? In inside of that little tiny stack. Um, here's what these things actually look like when you build them. So this is a bunch of them sitting together on a chip and then you can zoom in on one individual one again, 336 by 210 for this robot. Um, and this is sort of the structure of how data moves through it, right? So you can write instructions through the optical receiver into the memory and the controller. Uh, you can also feed data in through the temperature sensor and the electric field sensor. Um, and then the whatever you told it to do determines what data it sends to the actuator control circuitry to, to tell it how to move the legs. And, and roughly speaking, that's how this, this device works. Um, this is work done almost entirely by uh, two people, but the real hero of the story is my grad student, Maya Lassiter, who, who actually went from that chip into robots that, um, that you can now deploy and put on things. Uh, so here's one of these little tiny robots sitting in the zero of a, of a, of a penny, uh, 2020 penny. Um, and here's sort of the process of how we actually program them. So everything's done optically for these robots. You talk to the, the computer on board through light. Um, and the way it goes in the following is if you turn on a light um, and you have a sufficient intensity, again, they've been engineered to run at about daylight, um, the robot wakes up and goes into a default mode. So it is a default program that it automatically knows to start executing. Uh, if you want to overwrite that, you flash light at it, and there's a certain sequence of flashes that you have to do first, right? So it won't just automatically listen to anything. It has to see a series of bits that it knows mean you're trying to talk to it. And then the subsequent series of, of flashes and in intensity it interprets as the data stream. Um, what's cool is we built the circuit so you can do this two ways. There's a global passcode that all robots respond to, and then there are also robot-specific passcodes. So if you want to say, uh, robot A, here are your instructions, and B, here are yours, you can do that, and I'll, in fact, show you that that works. Um, and then the last bit of the data you send it is basically the go command, uh, the last part of the data stream, and then the robot will go off doing whatever you told it to do fully autonomously without you ever having to talk to it again. Um, if you want to start over, uh, you can either directly rewrite it from here, or you can just turn off the light and it takes you back to the default state on the other side because they have no permanent memory. Um, 
this works. We actually demonstrated this. One of the other fun things about this robot, which I, I super, I think is super important for the field, and I love it, uh, is that we get we actually have a programming interface. Um, so you can write instructions for this robot in Python finally. So that you don't have to do everything in some weird abstract form. Uh, you can write what you want it to do. And we built a little GUI for this. Um, this was largely by David's group um, in order to write, you know, quickly change what the robot is up to and then hit run. And this GUI basically compiles uh, whatever instructions you're trying to, to tell the robot to do into uh, a data stream that then goes to an optical controller, which generates the correct light flashes and programs the robot. Um, and so here we did this electronically just to show that this actually works. So we hooked up leads to the different legs of the robot. And then we sent it instructions to say, pull your front leg to a high voltage and whatever the rear one to a high voltage or a low or whatever, and tested that, okay, if I tell you to do to move your legs in this way, do you actually do it? And the answer is yes, we'll do whatever you want. Um, once we figured that out, we said, okay, that's pretty cool. So we basically got, you know, these four little pads. And one of the simplest things we could do is configure this robot to do the, the electrokinetic propulsion, the solid state propulsion, just the thing that looks like electrophoresis, where we don't have any legs and we just apply fields. And if we do that, then that means that uh, there are, you know, each of these legs you can address to be in one, high or low, right? There's two possible voltage states that it can take on. Um, and that means you have 16 total different configurations for, or 16 different voltage configurations, but 14 different locomotion configurations uh, for this given robot, right? Because two of them all high and all low don't correspond to anything electrically interesting. They're, they're zeros. Um, so these two students, uh, Maya and now Kyle, because this is a lot of experiment, experimental work to do, uh, went through and they characterized every single one of these different states to figure out what the robot actually does if you, if you apply those configurations of voltages. Um, we found some really nice stuff. Um, so we found you can obviously swim forwards and swim backwards. Um, you can laterally translate left and right. And then if you break symmetries by say putting, you know, whatever, a, you know, more or high on one side than the other, you actually get turns. Um, and what's, what was very nice, I, I think was frankly surprising is that uh, it's pretty good. Like if you compare the angle of turn that you get for two states that should be similar, like say this one and this one, uh, you're not so far off, um, which is pretty cool. So uh, we, we didn't do a bad job in building the robot, you know, where you see symmetries, they, they carry over in the data on the other side. Um, and then you can do fun stuff. So if you know all that, then you can say, okay, I'm gonna write a sequence of instructions to this robot where this robot will now step through a bunch of different types of motion. So here they are actually in actions, the robot sort of translating along in space. Uh, and then we're gonna tell it to turn, it's gonna turn, we're gonna tell it to slide, to slide and so forth and so on. Um, but again, this is not us really telling you what to do. This is us writing instructions to it and then the robot executing those instructions on the other side. Um, you can do other fun stuff like program them by name. So here we'll say uh, this robot on the left, we're gonna tell you to slide and we're gonna tell you to halt. And then in a second, we'll change our mind and we'll say, okay, now you're gonna turn and you're gonna halt. And then when this one's done turning, then we'll make that one turn too. So why do we care? Uh, kind of a cool accomplishment, right? Now you can do, not only can I write instructions as robots, but I can actually write instructions to either, either one. What's also neat too, and doesn't come across in this movie is that you don't actually have to know where that robot is, right? Because it's a global signal where you're just flashing light. It's not a requisite that you hunt it down with a laser and zap it. Anyone under the microscope that sees that command will pick up that set of instructions and then execute it. Um, the coolest thing we've managed to do with this robot, um, which is sort of, I think, where we're at currently in, in terms of the scope of things, is to do uh, what I think is, is totally a landmark. It's super awesome. Is to do uh, the first sort of sense think act loop for, for a micro robot, um, where there's no one in the loop. You wrote a program to it. You said go. And then the robot carried out a series of actions where a sensory input changes its behavior. Um, and I think, you know, this demonstration to me is super important because this is the first like real, I'm going to legitimately do something fully autonomous that does something that isn't a wind up toy, right? Where the outcome isn't fully predetermined. Um, so here's what we did. Uh, this robot recall has a temperature sensor on it and the default program that it executes um, does the following. Uh, basically the robot moves for a fixed number of cycles. It measures the temperature from the temperature uh, uh, sensor. And then it does a little, we call a wiggle dance to send the data back. You can think of it like a bee, how a bee moves to send data. And, and basically what it, what it literally does is it takes the temperature value, converts it to bits, and then does a, a, a forward backward motion where it's just Manchester encoding the bit stream to you. Um, so it's a digital signal that you're picking back up, which makes it very robust. Um, and then once it's done this, gets the end of this, it goes back to the thing and starts again. Um, so here's the little robot in action. This is its default motion. So we're, we've got it held down by a probe. We're gonna let it go. And then you can see it does like its own little kind of shuffle about you know, forward backwards. And that's it sending a zero to you, I think in this case, which is not interesting. Um, so what we did is we said, okay, that's kind of cool. Let's see if this really works. And so we took these little robots, we put them in the fridge for whatever, an hour, cools down the bath of the fridge. 
And then you take the, the bath back out, you put it under the microscope, and you let it warm back up to room temperature. Um, so it's a nice, easy, controlled global experiment. You put a probe in at the same time, and you make a measurement independently of the temperature, and then you decode the data the robot sends back to you. Um, for this measurement set, it's the red points are the data that we recorded off the probe, and the little green ones are the data we recorded off the robot, and they sit beautifully on top of each other, which I, I think is just so cool, right? So this little device is running around, measuring the temperature, and then feeding it back to you on the other side. Um, it's changing its behavior based on what it sees, and it's actually reporting data, so it's also two-way comms, which is very cool. Um, we're super, super excited about this. The other thing I'll say too is it's actually not a bad sensor, uh, that the resolution on the robot gets down to about 0.1 degrees, which frankly is pretty good, right? And so um, just from a from a science and engineering perspective, there's actually kind of a lot you could do with this. Um, and kind of where we're at now is taking sort of the next logical step and doing something more relevant to robotics. Um, so right now, if you were to drop by my lab, you'd find that we're working on building this little robot so it does thermophoresis. So it senses a temperature and then tries to climb that gradient to find higher values. So instead of wiggling, uh, changing its locomotion pattern to either turn or keep going in a given direction um, so that it can climb, climb a gradient on the other side. Um, and uh, I have every confidence that this is gonna work because uh, all the preliminary data is so awesome. It's just, just so close to me. Okay, so where are we going with this? Um, well, one of the visions for my group is the following. Uh, one of the things that made microelectronics really, really, really successful was the capacity to separate building electronics from designing electronics, right? That if you go to make a chip and you're a chip designer, you don't really have to know what the foundry does. You just have to lay out your thing in a simulation environment, compile the circuit, send it to the foundry, and then the foundry sends you back something that's, that works, right? That works on the other side. Um, and so this capacity to separate like the function of an object from how the object is built is, is super important in nanofabrication because not everyone is gonna wanna go in a clean room and build parts. Um, people who are circuit designers are interested in circuits. They're not interested in building circuits. They don't wanna have to know all the solid state physics and depth. Um, and so in microrobotics, you have a similar story where you're basically asking people to learn two com completely sort of orthogonal skill sets. How do you go into a clean room and microfabricate something? And that's insanely hard. And how do you do robotics? And that's also insanely hard. And asking one person to do both is a tall ask. Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about is the capacity to integrate computation and, and all of these other uh, parts within a clean room environment means that we may be able to do something very similar to what circuits did. To where uh, you know, our group or groups like us could fabricate the robot of your choice um, and you could just design it knowing that those parts are going to work and that you have control over the final device because it's programmable. So if you look at the things that I've shown you, uh, what we're trying to develop are sort of parts that play nice together and are interchangeable that facilitate people to design complexity uh, from, from the things we give you. Uh, so we now have actuators that give us uh, you know, movement on land, hopefully soon, in fresh water and salty water. Um, we have some ideas on how to go, how to make things that fly. Um, so you tell us where you want your robot to go. We'll tell you the actuator you should use. Uh, we currently have sensors for temperature, conductivity, and voltage. This list is going to grow. Um, it's very easy to develop sensors for microsystems. Uh, we have compute now with both memories and processors. Um, you can talk to it optically, and we're developing electrical and acoustic communication modules so that you can talk in other forms. Um, and we also have power. In our case, we've done everything optical, but if you've been paying attention, all I need is electrical energy. I don't care where it comes from. It could be chemical, it could be magnetic, it could be acoustic. You give me a way of converting that into amps and volts and, and we're good, we can use that. So everything that gets developed for IoT, everything that gets developed for implantables, wearable sensors, we steal that. And that becomes part of now our mechanism of powering robots. Um, and what we'd like to be able to do is to have somebody come along and say, okay, I want this, 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 and this have them compiled into a layout the way we do for circuits, and then we fab it and we'll send it to you. And that will be how you get your robots. Um, I'm very excited about this because I, I think this is a, a realistic near-term vision for what you'd be able to do in microrobotics. And I think if you pull it off, it lowers the barrier for entry that now anyone can do this. You don't need a state-of-the-art clean room at your university. Um, and it allows people who want to do robotics to focus on robotics, to focus on what does the robot do? How do I program it? What are good algorithms? How should I control it for locomotion? And have a lot of flexibility and that you don't have to go back to square one and rebuild the whole robot in the clean room the minute you want to change something. Um, so to me, that's an accelerator, right? It's a way of getting this field to move faster. Um, and I, I think that's kind of one of the directions that we're trying to push all of these pieces together for. Oh, what's that? Yeah, that's an, you weren't there for that part. Yeah, that's an array of micro, Rusno wants to know if this is an, on the right, is an array of micro robots. Yes, it's the answer. Okay, and the last bit, which I have just enough time, I go till what, 11.30, good? Okay, cool. So the last bit, which you have just enough time for is what are these for? 
right? Um, it's one thing to just be building robots all over the place, but what, what are you actually going to use these micro robots for? Um, and I'll say two things. I mean, one is you've sort of already seen a little bit of a gist of that in, in the electroplating robots making structures, right? You can do all kinds of cool things with robots. Um, and you've seen kind of pieces of a lot of these, right? Uh, one thing that you can do, which our group is interested in, is adaptable sensors and actuators. So building little things that say detect temperature and then report it back to you in space and time. Um, why is this useful? Well, a lot of microenvironments, you're not going to measure everything. That's too difficult. It's too much space. And maybe you only want to know it at a specific, you know, at a specific region, but you don't know where that is a priori. Um, this is a useful application of a robot that can either change in a dynamic environment, like a biological media where things change over time. Um, or where you don't necessarily know where you want to make the measurement ahead of time, it'd be great to have a sensor that you can reposition. Um, where one of the, an example of that is, say, a neural interfacing. Uh, so, you know, you may know this, but as you learn things, uh, your neurons move. Um, even just sitting here listening to me, your neurons are moving back and forth because you have blood flow inside of your brain. Um, and that makes measurements hard. Um, you'd really like it if you could reposition things over time dynamically or build things that are responsive. And so I think it's kind of another interesting avenue for micro robots. Um, this third bucket, you've kind of seen some of our work in already using these things as chemicals. I think one thing that fascinates me about biology uh, is that we often use it in, in industry like a chemical. So we do metal refinement with, with you know, archaea. They're, they're very similar to bacteria. Um, and we treat them, to, or we make drugs with, with all sorts of engineered microorganisms. We can treat them like chemistry because they're microscopic. They're invisible to us. We don't care. Um, but they can do things that are impossible for normal chemistry because they consume energy and they process information. Um, robots are kind of an interesting middle ground because uh, unlike biology, they're controlled. You actually know what they're doing, why, and you can change their behavior very dynamically. Um, and so there's kind of, I think, some interesting opportunities in building systems that, that from a user perspective, look like chemicals, uh, emulate biology to some degree by having these extra tools that aren't available to chemicals, but come with the benefits of being robots, right? That you can, you can control them and tell them what to do. Um, the last one, which I'll actually talk about in depth, is the story about regenerative medicine. Um, and I think this is where most people's minds go when you talk about micro robots is you say, okay, this tiny object, uh, what's going to be valuable to me that's small? And the answer is, well, probably something in your body because you're made of small things, right? There must be something in there that's important. Um, and I think that statement is certainly true. But I think one thing that's interesting about micro robots is it's, it's a little hard to sometimes realize that there are things in your, like, what is it exactly, right? What is the thing that's in your body that's so small, but also so important? Um, and so one of the things that we've started exploring, I think we have a great first example of that, which I'll, I'll talk with you a little bit today. Um, and that's your peripheral nervous system. So uh, your peripheral nerves are the nerves that wire your brain to the rest of your body. Um, and if you think about it, it's pretty crazy, right? These things are like single cell structures that are like meters long in length, um, but but are, you know, but they're, they're cells. It's like one cell body. It's pretty, pretty nuts. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, because they're responsible for wiring your body to the rest of your brain, they're vitally important to you. If you damage a peripheral nerve, you're going to lose sensory function. You're going to lose motor function. It's not going to be a positive outcome. Um, now, in the United States, there's something like 100,000 of these injuries that take place a year, and about half of them, even in surgical intervention, still end in failure, that you, you don't have any recovery at all. Um, and basically, the dividing line between whether the surgical intervention is successful or not is distance. It's, it's how far that nerve has to go between where it's been cut and where it was supposed to be wired to. Um, the reason is actually pretty simple, is that to restore motor function or sensory function, the nerve has to reconnect. It has to get back to the muscle target it was originally meant to be hooked up to. Um, and they, they do that naturally. They grow and try to reconnect, but they grow slowly. Um, and so if the distance is too far, the muscle loses the ability to, to reconnect to the nerve, and, and then you, you have no, out, no positive outcome. If the distance is short, um, then you can usually do some form of surgical intervention to try and try and help that out by putting in the guidance conduit, basically a little tube for the nerve to move down, or swapping a sensory nerve for a motor nerve is another strategy that's available to you. Um, but to the extent that that's true, uh, you could characterize helping these injuries as essentially a race against time. And what you really want to do is uh, make that nerve go if you could just get it to grow quicker, then the distance you could cover would be longer and more of the, the injuries would be able to be healed. Um, now, uh, the problem is that none of the techniques we currently have do that. Uh, they basically act as guidance mechanisms for nerves, but, but none of them really accelerate the rate at which nerves grow. And so you're left with sort of that critical cutoff distance that you need to be shorter than in order to have any, any real, um, any real uh, plan or approach. Um, now, I gave a talk on microrobots back when I started at Penn um, to some folks in the School of Medicine. Uh, my colleague, Casey Cullen, uh, pointed out to me, uh, these two images would be roughly to scale. Uh, so this is a nerve bundle. It's a collection of, of these nerves that uh, would be in your peripheral nervous system. You know, whatever, this is cross-section of it, false colored in the SEM. And here's one of these little tiny robots on the other side. 
Um, and so these are literally comparable. And Casey pointed out one other interesting fact, which is uh, there is a way of actually making these nerves grow faster, which is to pull on them. Um, it's well known that if you take a nerve and you apply tension on it, you can make it grow about tenfold faster. Um, you have to apply a specific amount of tension. If you pull too hard, you'll rip it. If you don't pull hard enough, it doesn't do anything. Um, and that force scale is about one nanonewton, which is exactly the force output of this robot's actuators. Um, so we got really interested in this idea. We said, oh, wow, that, that's actually kind of a cool idea. Could you build micro robots that would literally pull nerves back to where they need to go, um, that are chemically functionalized, so nerves attach to them, and then tow this nerve bundle back to where it's supposed to go? Um, so it's early days for us. Uh, we, we haven't been able to successfully do that yet, but it's super exciting and fun. Uh, what we have been able to do is co-culture these without killing each other, which is great. Um, so we can, we can grow. Uh, this is a, a model of, of, a, of a nerve bundle called the dorsal root ganglia that's growing happily with one of our micro robots. Um, we've also been able to get them to grow happily on top of the micro robots so we can get nerve bundles to grow on top of a little tiny device. Um, and we've even been able to actuate these poor little robots once they're covered in that goop. And you can see this one's a little bundle there. It's correctly moving. It's stretching this little bundle on the other side. Um, this robot was unfortunately wired wrong electrically. So that was on us. We actually screwed it up. And that's why the actuator doesn't fully work. Um, but I'm still super confident about this. I think it's really exciting to see that you're even pulling on this biology at all. Typically, you build something synthetic that moves. You put it in with biology, it dies. Um, and so we're very excited to see where this project is going to go. Um, so this is getting to the end of the talk, and I'll, I'll leave you with one thought. Um, and I, I, this is kind of, I think, our, our tagline for maybe the group, which is uh, we're entering the age where the micro world is no longer the privileged universe of biology. Um, and I really think that's true, right? That uh, if you're to think about the field, like if you're a micro or a nano person, uh, most of what you've been able to do for the vast history of, of ever is watch things in microscopes, right? From von Leeuwenhoek to very recently, you can look at cells under microscopes and you can do a little bit of manipulation in certain ways with light, but you can't really get in there, right? You can't really manipulate things or pull things or, or really have control in the same way that biology does. It's just remarkably more advanced than us. Um, I think what's really exciting about, about microrobots is that this is now finally a tool that takes you into that space. And in the same way, like you can watch Mars with a telescope. We can't go there yet. We can send a robot there and learn an awful lot. Um, I think that's what these little guys do for us in the micro world. They're our way, our avatar, our thing that we're going to send into the microverse to be able to manipulate and explore. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited as, as, you know, this is just Gen 3 as this field continues to progress. So with that, I will thank all my students who make the work possible. And I see Ruz now has a question. <laughs> all right, thanks. So we've got time for questions and have millions of questions because your work is ex super exciting. Thanks. And uh, and really fundamental, which belongs to academia. Really. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is not really a startup kind of company stuff. I was caught in one of your slides. You said that the robots can do chemistry. Yeah. Can you please uh, elaborate what kind of actions, chemical actions, are you? talking about are you talking about mixing dividing what what manipulatory yeah you, you, can you do you raise a really good question so <clears throat> we just want to know what what chemical actions we, we were talking about and um in this talk i'm talking largely about electrochemistry about, what? So, about electrochemistry so having two metallic surfaces and then driving current but your broader question is correct and i didn't talk about it you can do mixing and you can control flows. And so from a broader like chemical engineering perspective, you can do a lot. It cells. I mean, I can imagine a kind of micro robot lab, chemical laboratory. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll tell you later about something you'll find really cool, but I can't tell you yet because it's a proposal I'm writing and I, we're taping this. So, I, so uh, but but I think, I think, yeah, you're exactly right. Be happy to beat the sound or whatever. Yeah, but I, I think the, the broader point you're making is exactly right, right? Is that like, you know, and you can think of lots of applications for that too. Um, like when we do like cell culture, you'd really love to have a little bit more control over gradients and ions or gradients and growth factors or nutrient perfusion because the body does really complex things that we don't know how to do in microfluidics yet. Um, but just even having like little tiny, you know, pumps that have electronic control opens up all kinds of new avenues on the other side. So it's, you're right, here I'm talking about electrochemistry, but in the broader sense of like, if you include transport phenomena too, you have unbelievable control that you didn't have before. Very good, very good.
Yeah, great talk, Mark. Really exciting work. Um, I was curious about, you know, kind of their transition into kind of using the robots within or, you know, within human tissue. Um, you mentioned the the nerve kind of yeah. looking at whether it could become a conduit for nerve growth. I'm wondering, have you explored the different types of biological um, environments that the robots can be compatible in? And when do they fail or you know, or can they fail or what do you need to do differently in order for them to be able to be in situ, you know, in biological systems? It, it's probably gonna take me like the rest of my life to answer that question. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a totally fair point. So basically where, where we're at, um, part of the money for the stretch growth project is intended to address some of that is to look at like, how does propulsion work in tissue models or in, in like uh, excised tissue models from like animals and things like that. Um, I think the there's, you know, it's just never ending the unknowns in that space. So the, the pluses we can say is that if you look at, say, the exterior of the robot, uh, it's all made from things that are currently in implantables. So that's good. So we don't have any toxic effects, presumably, from there. Um, we worked really hard in the, the movie you saw in the stretch growth case of packaging a lot of the actuator internal to the robot so that and giving it enough force so that it has about a thousand like that robot. I, I skipped over this. It actually has a thousand fold more force than it nominally needs because we're presuming propulsion and tissue is a lot harder than water um, and, and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's also known generally like in the microbiotics field, you often have to do surface functionalization to both prevent yourself from getting killed by white blood cells and to prevent yourself from getting stuck in the tissue. Um, so I think those are like the knowns. The unknowns, there's a lot, right? Like you don't know what the immune response is gonna look like for something that's the size of a white blood cell. <laughs> like it's a it's a pretty weird space. Um, and, and so there's just tons we're gonna have to do. And, and my vibe, it's like everything else in medicine, right? Like you gotta just do it. There's no way around it, so. Just a little clarification on that, um, a little bit more detail on you. So you're assuming that the robot will move through tissue? So for the first generation of the stretch growth robot, the idea is that it's implanted within the guidance conduit that a surgeon would typically apply. So uh, there you're just really trying to accelerate recovery as opposed to elongate the distance. And, and that's like a lower hanging fruit. So the two, the two other secret things in, in stretch growth is like most nerve injuries are pretty close to the surface of, of your skin. It's like your hand and you're cutting with a knife or something like that. Um, and so the other question we get asked a lot is, well, how are you going to power them in the body? And for most nerve injuries, you're actually close enough to the surface where light still works. You can do that. Um, and the second is, okay, well, how are you going to move in tissue? And sort of the low hanging fruit is you say, I'm not, we're going to, we're going to build this tube and plant it in the tube and we see how far we get. Um, but you're right. Like longer term, like, I, you know, I don't even know how to design for locomotion for that, right? Like, it's like tissue is a weird space. Like, it's it's really nonlinear. It's dynamic, and like, that's going to be a hard problem. It's going to take us time. Okay. So we're trying to stage it, I guess, is the answer, right? As you don't go right for the worst thing. Um, Mark, you had hinted that you're kind of right now. You're looking at opto, you know, like you're usually using opto genetics. So you're like mostly lights to power. Yeah. You mentioned kind of like you're exploring other ways of speaking to your robots. Yes. Um, have you actually done experiments with like, uh, what I'm thinking about is there There was a lot of work in medical robotics where they were looking at uh, small pills for um, oh, yeah. uh, delivery of drugs, et cetera. Um, do you see a space for your robots in that space as well? Because those are much bigger than the ones that you're you're working with. So I think it's like two parts. Um, it sounds like like do you, how else can you power them, and uh, what about drug delivery ish kind of stuff. So the power of them, um, you know, the reason we like light, honestly, is because uh, a you have a microscope already, so you're gonna, you know, and, and biologists have given us the most awesome, like uh, as you point out, like optogenics is a huge field, so you get to steal all their stuff. So as they get better at multiplexing lasers, we get better at multiplexing lasers. Um, but the real reason is because you're already building silicon electronics and silicon solar cells are great. So you may as well just make that your power source for starters. Um, the two other power transmission techniques we're super interested in are acoustic and, um, and magnetic fields. And uh, the obvious reason is because you want to go in the body, right? Or, or optically occluded environments and those two usually work. Um, they're also attractive because uh, if you're in water, the wavelength of sound in, in ultrasound is, is about 70 microns to 100 microns, which means you can build resonant structures. So normally, like if you try to do power coupling for, for any of these things, uh, it's hard in the electromagnetic domain because you don't have resonance. And, and that means your coupling is very poor. 
Um, if you do it in the mechanical domain, you do have resonance. And then there's ways of building relatively efficient power comms links. Um, in the magnetic space, there's other tricks you can do that are emerging. So uh, thanks to IoT, like there's now a handful of different ways that you can do power transfer um, to electrically small antenna. Uh, they're all really hard, but both of those two things are really hard to build compared to solar cells. And so like kind of my vibe is until we need it, uh, we're going to keep doing solar cells. Um, fortunately though, we did, we did just get a grant to do, um, it's not related to robotics, but basically to do uh, ocean monitoring type stuff, like building little sensor packages that, that, that communicate acoustically. Um, and so that's, I think going to be our first step, our baby step into it is building that, that acoustic comms module. Um, and then the drug delivery part, like, I think what I worry about for us is size is I think we have to get like, that's always the catch, right? Is, is you can precision deliver this drug, but your robot's really small. And so you either need to be like real precise or that, and that drug's real potent or it's not going to work. And, and um, I've never really, you know, I need to do more work to look into how that trade-off works. I don't think we're quite precise enough <laughs> in most of the stuff we build to be able to accurately deliver it. But I think that's always been that challenge, right? It's like the bigger stuff's easier because you get a big volume. And so you can kind of screw up on the precision a little and then dump it. And it's it's better than ingesting the drugs and dumping them everywhere, uh, but it still has clinical impact. I think the smaller stuff gets tricky because it's like, I really got to get every robot there or this isn't going to work correctly. And now you've got, you've got stuff trying to pick you off as you go, right? Your liver is trying to kill off the robots and the white blood cells are trying to kill off the robots. Um, so I don't know. We have to look into where we really fit in that space. And I, I don't have a good answer. Uh, great, great talk, Professor Minsky. I have a small question. Uh, when you talk about the tiny robot with the solar cells that you study first with uh, like in the liquid solution, I wonder what's what limits the like robot in air? Like is the oh, friction? Yeah. That's a really good question. So why is it so hard to leave the water basically? Um, and the answer is surface forces. Um, that if I, you know, any time two things come into contact, there's a force that, that wants to pull them together. It's basically like surface tension, but it applies to everything, you know, metals, solids, anything like that. And for big things, you couldn't care less, right? That's a very small force. I have no issue putting my hand in and peeling it off. Um, for small things, you care enormously. And, and the reason it's really simple is that that force is, if you think of it as a surface tension, it's a force per length. And so the scale of that force is surface tension times length. As you go down in size, length becomes big compared to other stuff. For me, my inertia goes as length cubed, which when you're large is a big number relative to length. When you're small, it's the other way around. You cube a tiny number, it gets much smaller than order one. And so uh, when you're, the, the nice thing about being in water is there's other things that come into play. So for instance, you can have surfactants like soap that mediate that surface force, or you can have charges on the interfaces that act for repulsion. There's ways of stabilizing it. In air, not so much, right? In air, the surface force is the surface force. And when you touch something, you die. So uh, to get, to be able to walk, you have to build a, an actuator that's forces larger than the contact adhesive force. And that brings the force scale up by like two or three orders of magnitude relative to what you need to do in water. Um, and that's, that's, that's the real challenge. Not for all of these, uh, most of them are charge stabilized, to be honest, in this case, that you have charges on the, well, that's kind of one of the things we found out early on, we had surfactant and everything, and then we sort of figured out we didn't really need it. Um, but I'm just saying there are more tricks you can play. If you're in water, you have, you have options, there's ways of managing it. If you're in air, you really don't. And it's like, you just have to have a strong enough foot. It's worth pointing out biology kind of has the same story, right? You don't see a lot of walking things in air under hundred microns, right? They, they kind of like cells like water. They want to stay in water. They like to stay wet. And, and when you take them out of that, they die. Right? So uh, there's a little bit of that there too. That's one also clarification on the um, air actuator i think you said eap was that, that electroactive polymers or that's yep. a different these electric polymers yeah but very different than the traditional electroactive polymers or is i mean you know there's some there's definitely similarity um and and like you know uh yeah i i think the big difference from us was changing how we fabricate them and, and that was kind of the the novelty um so like, you know, people made like tiny electroactive polymer actuators for like micro robot applications, like in 2000, right? And, and make like little grippers and grab balls and move them around. Um, they're hard to work with in the clean room though, uh, because uh, the way you pattern things in a clean room is with polymer. And then you have to remove that polymer to leave behind the silicon. And what usually happens is you kill the actuator in the process. Um, so we had to do some fancy tricks to figure out how to orthogonalize those two and then kind of get them to play nice in the end. Um, and that was kind of the novelty. But the material is pretty much off the shelf. As we said, okay, this is well-established. These people know all kinds of stuff. Let's just take their design. 
Very cool. Um, I have one more question, unless there's anyone else in the room or anyone online have questions. Okay, so one um, one more question. Um, when you think about, so there are a bunch of different projects here, but uh, when you think about, let's say, the foundry or um, the walking uh, programmable robot, what is the difficult thing, the first, like, toughest nut to crack that you are working on now to, to get to that next step? Oh, okay. So you're saying what's the current, like, biggest roadblock? Yeah. So I think... Um... Let's see. So there's there's two, honestly, and and uh, actually they kind of stem from the same place. So from a robotics point of view, uh, I think kind of the the things you'd really love to have more of that you don't. One is memory, right? And and you know that um, that that like the, even the smart robot, you have a glorious four kilobits, which gives you thirty one instructions, right? You're you're like Apollo eleven, right? It's, there's not much you can really do. Uh, there's there's interesting things, but there's not a lot. And um, that figure of merit, you might say, why is that so small, right? Like I carry around in my pocket. Thumb, a thumb drive has got a terabit per square inch. If you do the math, you, you think you should have like 32 megs. There should be a lot of data on that robot. Um, and the reason is because we make memory with basically different materials in a different process than we make electronics. And, and that sort of lives at the heart of a lot of these issues. Um, so the other one, like comms, right? Like why is it so hard to have the piezo or to put a little LED on it or whatever? Again, they're different materials. They have a good LED. It has to be crystalline. And that means it's grown on this big wafer. And then you got to figure out how to get them to play nice. Um, so I think, you know, from a robotics point of view, memory is the big one. And we, if we just had more, we'd be able to do a lot more. A lot of the other cool stuff like comms, you can probably figure out ways to work around. Um, I think that the broader question for the field is like figuring out how to get these parts to stitch together in a way that's massively parallelizable that you don't give that up. That's something our group is very good at, but we're still bad at it. You know what I mean? Like there's still a lot to do and uh, we can do it with a handful of functionalities. Like we can do massive parallelism for actuators. What you'd really love is anything, right? Like give me comms, give me sensors. I want to do acoustics. I want to do LEDs. I want to do biology. And I want to always have like some super high performance material that I figure out how to seamlessly integrate all in parallel. And that's the really hard part, right? That's the part that you, that's the thing you're going to chip away at over the next 20, 30 years. Um, yeah. All right, thanks, Mark. Let's give him a hand. It's a wonderful talk. Uh, okay, so please stay tuned for next semester, spring 2024 Grasp on Robotics lineup coming soon. For more information on upcoming events, be sure to follow us on social media. Check out our website. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. Great.